Howdy, and welcome to the Breakaway Podcast. Breakaway is a Bible study recorded on the campus of Texas A&M. For more information on Breakaway, please visit breakawayministries.org. We hope you enjoy the message and stick around for more at the end. Well, it was interesting in preparation for tonight, I kept thinking about my first uh, experience walking into Kyle Field. It was my freshman year for Midnight Yell. And I came in knowing surprisingly little about Texas A&M when I arrived as a student. And so that was my first time to walk into Kyle Field. And I was coming with my roommates who were seniors at the time, and I was like, so what is this we're doing now? Like, we're going to practice for the yells we're going to do tomorrow? And they're like, yeah, that's kind of how it goes. We're going to come, and we practice at midnight for some reason uh, for the yells that we'll do tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, that's great. And they're like, yeah. So we're going to practice the yells, and then at a certain moment, they're going to turn out the lights, and you're going to make out with the girl you brought. And I was like, "Um, wait, I'm sorry, what? Like, yeah, you're going to turn out the lights, and you're going to make out with somebody. But don't worry, if you didn't bring somebody, which I didn't bring somebody, like, that's not going to be a problem. We'll give you a lighter. You're going to hold up a light, and uh, someone will come around and find you, and you'll make out with them. And I was like, what? what? Like, suddenly, like, all this stress came up. And I was like, what does that have to do with football? Like, I'm not prepared for this moment at all. And they didn't present it to me as something that was, like, optional, you know? <laughs> I was a freshman scared to death. I was like, what am I supposed to do? And kind of thinking through my play, like, do I call, act like I'm sick? Do I hit the ground? Like, what do I do? And uh, I wasn't sure. I'm, I'm not ready for this. And so uh, I don't know. I think I shook my roommate's hand or something like that. I was like, mm, good game. You know, sort of. Uh... <laughs> but I remember it struck me as interesting just when they turned out the lights in that instant. I thought, how amazing that something as simple as flipping a light switch just kicked off a million different emotional responses in this place, you know? Like that simple act just conjured all kinds of responses. Like some people were so excited. They were waiting for that moment because they were with somebody that maybe they just started dating or it was the first night and things are going pretty well. And so they were thinking through their play, like looking at them going, you know, it's like, so they're all kind of geared up, butterflies going, like there's that person that's all excited. I was like, and then there's that couple that's been dating for like 14 years, you know, <laughs> which isn't even right. But you know that couples like that, that they come to college and they're already like an old couple, you know what I mean? So they're at the game, they're like, oh, here we go. <laughs> you know, there's that couple that is kind of kind of comforting business as usual. There's other people, when those lights clicked out, it just made them think about who was there with them at midnight yell last time that isn't now. And you know, all the pain that rises up and just the bitterness of it that they're like, every midnight yell reminds me that I'm desperately alone, you know? <laughs> And I just thought, how interesting. Just that simple click of the lights conjures all these different emotional responses in a moment, right? And the same thing happens when you mention the word dating. Just by thinking about the concept of dating, millions of responses come up in different crowds of us. I've said the word dating in front of crowds and they've cheered that we're going to talk about it. I've said it in front of crowds and they've groaned that we're going to talk about it. You get all kinds of different responses. And it's fascinating because dating is an exciting, stressful, sad, exhilarating experience. You see people land all over the map coming up and talking about dating. For some people, it just brings up all kinds of stress because they go, I don't know how to do it. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do if I'm interested in somebody. Do I call them? Are they going to think I'm a stalker? Like, why is he calling me? So, okay, I'm supposed to what? Just like comment a lot on their Instagram at one point? Or people are like, what are you doing? You're like, I don't know. So should I try to send a private message? Or is that trying to create a secret world too fast? Or so do I text them? I don't know. And when I ask them out, ask them out to where? Do I try to make it chill? Like, I don't know. Let's just go study. And they're going to be like, are we hanging out? Are we dating? What do you even call it? So where do I invite them? Do I invite them to a coffee shop? Do I invite them to Breakaway? Maybe some of you tried that even now. I don't know. So you do. I try, what am I supposed to do with them, right? For other people, it's a great source of joy, dating. Because as soon as it comes up, you think about that time you did get the text from that guy, right? And he was like, hey, do you want to meet up? And you're like, I think he, oh my God, oh my God. And you showed all your friends, uh, have you seen this? What do you think this means? I don't know what it means. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I don't know what you're trying to say. Oh my God. And you start thinking, no, 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 no. And you're going to erase it. And you're going to erase it. And then he's just seeing those little dots go by. Like, what is she going to say? Oh my God. And she says, yes, I'm going to go. And she's all celebrating with her friends. I'm going to go with him. And he just drops his phone and is like, say my name. It's happening, people. Right? And there's, there's joy that rises up in people when they think about dating and the potential of it. And there's also pain. 
And I'll be honest with you, um, I remember one of the times we met out here at Breakaway uh, at Kyle Field, we decided to do something where we set out all these trash cans and we had people, we just talked about dark sins, secret sins will eat you up inside and you don't need to carry them. And so we said as a first step, why don't you write out some things that you go, I'm carrying some guilt and shame over this thing and I need to get it out and let this be a first step. And we had thousands of students walk down and drop all these comments in these trash cans down at the front of Kyle Field. And I went through and started looking over them as I was praying for these students, and probably three, four out of five were about desperate hurt and desperate heartbreak because they got into a relationship they know they shouldn't have, or a relationship went places they wished it hadn't, or they had done some things that felt right in the moment and now they deeply regret, and they've burned some bridges, hurt some relationships, lost some friends. And I'll tell you what, in my office, nobody cries like the person that's been broken up with. I've counseled students through death and they don't cry like the people who are broken up with. The death of a relationship can be so painful, right? This impulse in us to pair off is good. It's powerful. And when we pair off well, it's an exhilarating power. When it goes poorly, it's deeply painful for us. And so I want to talk about how do we do it right, right? And so here's a few things, because I think it's so confusing. We did a series on dating a few years ago, and I tried to avoid it for years, and then I realized you got to do it every couple years because the language changes, the culture changes, and so much has changed about you guys, and I've read countless articles about you and your dating trends uh, to the point where I'm just exhausted by them. But let me tell you (laughs) a few things that we do know. The vast majority of you want to get married. There was a survey that came out a few years ago that said when asked, do you want to be married, only 70% of millennials said yes. That means 30% said no, and it kicked off a torrent of commentaries and articles being written saying that's the lowest percentage in history. There's this massive number of people that are millennials that don't want to get married, and it launched all these comments. We're like, marriage is therefore a dead institution. Therefore, we need to do away with marriage. Therefore, we should just have little short-term contracts every two years. We should have beta marriages, move into other, polyamorous this, and there's going on and on and on. And then they did a second survey where they asked the same groups, people, same age group, would you like to be unmarried your entire life? And only 8% said yes, which means 92% want to get married. So when you ask people, do you want to get married? Only 70% said yes. And so then they said, do you want to not be married? And only 8% said yes. So 92% want to get married. It just depends on how you ask the question. <laughs> It took a lot of reading to land on that, y'all. <laughs> That's number one. The vast majority of you want to get married, right? And here's number two. The vast majority of you will get married. If the statistics hold all throughout history, the vast majority of you will get married. And I know that brings up some fear in some people. You're like, well, what if I'm the one that doesn't get married? You might be. I don't know. But the vast majority of you <laughs> will get married. And here's the mind-blowing thing that's been tripping me up lately. The vast majority of you will get married in your 20s. If you look at the globe (laughs) through human history, the vast majority of human beings get married in their 20s. Isn't that crazy? That that's such a big thing in your life, such a big decision. And for the vast majority of you, in the next seven to 10 years, you will meet that person and settle down with them. You're going to pass through these distinct phases of singleness, dating, engaged, married, pretty soon. And we got to figure out how to navigate those, right? And yet here's the interesting thing about your generation that's unique. So you're like all other generations in the fact that you want to get married as bad as they do, and you probably will get married around when they did. But here's the reality is that you are waiting longer to get married than any generation in human history. Your generation's waiting longer to get married more than any generation since it's been recorded. The average young person now gets married at age 27 if you're a woman, 29 when you're a man. To put that in perspective, in the 1990s, the average woman got married in 23, age 23, the average man age 26. It's the 1990s, that's not like back in the 40s or something, right? (laughs) But now it's 27 and 29. And so I've been looking at that about you. The vast majority are getting married much, much later. And the question's arisen in my mind, why? Why, if everyone wants to get married, are we waiting so long to get married? 
And there's all kinds of different reasons of studies of why it's happening with you guys. And there's a bunch of different reasons. Maybe you'll resonate with some of these. I'm not going to go through them all exhaustively. But number one is there's a fear of divorce. Some of you saw your parents get divorced. You saw the pain it caused. You felt the pain it caused in your life. And you say, I don't want to rush into marriage because I don't want to rush into a mistake. And so we're going to wait and wait and wait to be sure. And I resonate with that. Some of you, it's concern that marriage will derail your plans. There's some people that say, well, man, I have some plans. I need to figure out where I'm going in my life. I need to get my career on track. I have some goals with my career. And if I get a husband, he might interfere with those. If we have kids, they'll definitely interfere with them. (laughs) So I got to get these people out of the way so they don't mess up my life. And so in the past, where marriage used to be the first step into adulthood, they called it cornerstone marriage, where you would build your adulthood. Now it's the last step. Let me get some financial security, get my career rolling, and let's have a capstone marriage. It'd be sort of the last thing I do after I got everything else in my life figured out because I want to make my decisions without someone else influencing me. There's this impetus for autonomy. Auto, which means self, nomos, law, I rule. I decide my life, not somebody else. Number three is confusion about communication. And we talked about that last semester, about the advent of technology has made it super confusing. Like in the past, if you wanted to ask someone on a date, you would call them. Now they think you're insane or something. You're like, I don't know, is it safe to call, you know? Or should I only text? Or should I do Facebook? Or is Facebook lame now? I don't know. And so there's all this confusion about how to talk to each other. And for some people, that slowed down the dating process. For others, it's the paralysis of endless options. You go back in the day in the 40s, no, excuse me, in the 1930s, one third of all couples who got married lived within a five block radius of each other before they got married. One in six lived on the same block. One out of every eight lived in the same building. 1930s. So basically you would turn 20 and be like, you, you good? Okay, let's go. (laughs) That's basically how it went. Now you get online and it's just this endless sea of options from around the globe and you're just swiping through them going, her, no, her, no, Eh, she likes a different football team, no, right? And on and on we go and there's this paralysis of seemingly endless options, right? For others, it's the pressure to find a soulmate that I'm not just looking for a good companion in life, I'm looking for someone who will complete me. That they will fill every vacancy and awaken the dormant gifts inside. That I'm looking for some person to do some amazing things in me to fill my soul, right? For others, it's the fulfillment of sex outside of a relationship. That in the past, sexual drive would lead people into marriage because marriage was the safest place and the right place to have sex. Now, sex has been taken outside of that, right? And the reality is some people go in. Sex was a big driver into marriage, but now sex can be had anywhere, anytime, with people, not with people online. I can do whatever. And uh, it's delayed the covenanting with another human being. And it was interesting, as I've been reading all this about you guys and just kind of thinking about all this, I was looking at what are the main drivers for delaying getting married. And as I was looking at what's driving our fears, it's fear. Fear of making a mistake, fear of missing out, fear of losing opportunities. It's pride. I want to run my own life. Or it's lust. I don't want to have to commit to love you emotionally. I just want to look at your body or use it for a night. And so fear, lust, and pride are driving a lot of our relational decisions these days. And let me tell you something, young people. They are not driving us in the best of directions. For the first time in the history of our country, the average age of a first birth, of a first having a child, is younger than the average age of your first marriage. On average, women in America are having their first child at age 26, and the average woman in America gets married at age 27. That hasn't happened in the history of our nation. That 48% of the children born in our country today are born with dad already gone. And every measurable we have about children says without a loving two-parent home, it does inestimable damage to a young person to not have the security of a loving mom and dad in the home, right? Dating websites are 
I'm not going to bash on them. I know people that have met on them, but as you've watched the trend in dating websites, it's moving more and more towards just analyzing people's physicality, that we're basing relationships from 2005 to 2012, one third of all couples who got married in America met on a dating site. And as you look at the progression of dating sites, it's built almost entirely on charm or beauty, which are not good foundations for a marriage, right? And the reality is the Center for Disease Control just put out a recent study, the Center for Disease Control, that said the advent of Tinder and things like that have seen a skyrocketing percentage of sexually transmitted diseases in Rhode Island since the advent of Tinder and Grindr, et cetera. Syphilis has gone up 79%. 79%! Gonorrhea and HIV, over 30%, right? And some of you aren't on that because in college you don't have to, right? But the reality is, man, as you look at self-reporting in college students and in young people in their 20s, there's more self-reported loneliness and depression than previous generations. Why am I telling you all this? Because there's a connectivity with technology, but there's a loss of community. And we have fear and lust and pride driving us into shallow relationships or keeping us away from relationships. And the reality is the directions our fears and lusts and pride are leading us aren't the best directions. So you go, what are you advocating, Ben? Some throwback to some bygone era that was amazing when we all got married at 13 and had kids when we were 14. No. I don't have some kind of misty-eyed, glowy view of the past. I don't. But the reality is I look at us today and go, man, we are adrift in life of how to relate to each other. And there's a lot of pain out there in us. And the reality is we're not sure how to connect with one another. And we are like lost at sea out here in the midst of a loss of intimacy. And often where there's a loss of intimacy, addiction takes its place. And we see many of us struggling with addictions and wrestling with intimacy, and we're adrift, and it's really hard to find a partner in life when we don't even know what life's about. It's hard to find a companion on the journey when we don't know where our life is going. And so as we talk about dating and relationships and singleness, what I wanted to start with tonight is not how to get a date, because the truth is anyone can get one. You can get one tonight. You lower your standards enough, you can get married tonight, right? <laughs> so we'll talk about how to get married later. But the truth is, before we get into how we deal with this other person, we have to deal with us. There's something going on with us that we're like people lost at sea. And here's the good news. If you're lost out there, if you were lost back in the day, if you were lost out in a life raft at sea, there's something you can always know that's amazing, and that is the North Star always points true north. And so wherever you're lost on the sea, if you were out in a raft, if you could find the North Star, you could figure out where you are. Steve Callahan was lost in a little rubber life raft for 76 days in the Pacific Ocean by himself. He found the North Star and used what he knew of nautical realities, measuring its distance from the horizon. He knew exactly what latitudinal line he was on on the globe and was able to paddle safely to the Caribbean. Right? And the reality is wherever you feel lost, some of you have been in relationships and have been burned and been hurt. Some of you have never been in relationships and are scared and don't even know how to start it and you feel adrift in the world, but wherever you feel lost, there's a true north, a relationship with God that if we can get that right, it will help us navigate our relationships with each other right. And let me tell you something, we must get our relationship with God right before we'll ever get a relationship with a guy or a girl right. And the truth is, as you look at our Bible, as our Bible speaks to us about human life, there's sections on sex and dating and marriage and relationships. You get the first couple meeting in Genesis. You get Song of Solomon. You get talking about singleness in 1 Corinthians. You get the marriage passage in Ephesians. And if we were to add up all the sections about dating, it would add up to about this much. And there's this whole other part that you go, Ben, if I want to get married, I want to get dating. You're saying that's all the Bible cares about? What is all this? Dating's the biggest thing in my life. <laughs> well, it's big when it's right in front of your face. But when you pull it back, it is not the biggest or most critical relationship in your life, so it's not the one that the Bible is the most concerned with. It's interesting, when Jesus sat down with the woman at the well, he sat with her and he talked about living water. And he said, hey, you've had five husbands. 
and the guy you're shacking up with now, he's not your husband. And then he said to her, what you need is living water, and if you knew who I was, you'd ask me, and I'd give it to you. And what Jesus was saying to this woman is, you have been looking for satisfaction for a deep soul thirst in the arms of a man, and you've misdiagnosed your need. Before you seek a guy or a girl, you need to get on board with God. Before your marriage, you need to meet your maker because it's in the stability of walking with him that we have the resources to be a blessing to each other. We have to be connected to a source of life if we are going to be a source of life. That's the reality. And so it's interesting in 1 John chapter 4, as John is talking to us about love, he says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, and the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. I love it. He's talking about love, and he's saying to the people who know God, let us love one another, but then he doesn't give them a threat on the other side. Love one another, or else God will be mad. Love one another, or else you'll get in trouble. He says, love one another. Why? Because love is from God, and everyone who knows God loves And so he begins the verse by saying, beloved, love. When you know you're beloved by God, it's easy to love other people. When you have a relationship in the beloved, you have a source with which to love and care about others, right? If I have a source of love, I can be a source of love. If I have an eternal source of life, I can be a source of life. And let me tell you something, as you look at the Bible, that's how it was always meant to be. That when you look in Genesis as God is creating the world in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis 1 isn't so much about creation, it's about the God of creation. And as it shows us him making the world, we won't go through all the text, but let me just tell you, as it begins, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then it says, and the earth was formless and void. It was without form, without structure, and it was void without fullness. It had no structure, and it had no life. It's two words in Hebrew, tohu and bohu, right? Which sounds like a clown duo, but it's Hebrew. (laughs) And it's presenting a problem at the beginning of Genesis as God looked out. There was no structure, and there was no life. And then it says the Spirit of God began to hover over the waters, that God began to move towards the chaos, and God began to speak. And as you see, as God begins to weave creation together, he starts to build the forms that in days one, two, and three, you see God begin to create. He creates the heavens. He creates the sky. He creates the sea. He creates the land. And in days one, two, and three, you see him create these static life support systems, these teleological structures that could fill life. And then in days four, five, and six, he fills them with life. He builds form and then he fills them with birds to fill the sky, sea creatures to fill the water, animals to fill the land. He filled structure so that living things can succeed. He builds a form so that we can flourish in life. And then on day six, you see why he was doing it all. He quits the impassive, let there be light, let there be fish, let there be cattle. And he speaks to himself and says, let us make man in our image. And you realize what he was doing by creating this world is he wasn't just creating something to display himself. He was creating a home to live and enjoy his love. I had a good buddy in college that when we got out of college, he met the girl of his dreams. She was an Australian ballerina, which is as cool as it sounds. And they got engaged, and I don't know if you know this about engagement, we'll talk about it later this semester, engagement, you know, kind of sucks, because you get all the, you know, struggles of having to, like, plan a huge event with your whole family, and, like, work on a budget, and all kind of the stresses of marriage without any of the satisfaction, right? So, as a guy, you got to do something with all that pent-up energy, right? So he built all the furniture in their home from scratch. I don't mean he went to Ikea. I mean he went to a forest. I mean, literally, he was like, that looks like an entertainment center, all right? And he just, <laughs> just sanded it and lathe, and he just built his furniture. I can't even put together a desk 
from Ikea, literally, I'll just get it all out. And I'm like, what the, what are these pictures? And my wife will just slowly move towards me and be like, put down the little bag of screws. I got it. And she takes over. I can't put together uh, a desk from Ikea. He's out and he is just fashioning things from raw materials with this strength of his hands <laughs> and with the intellect of his mind, right? Out of the love in his heart, right? And I remember I was with him in that house the night before he got married. I'm looking around, I'm like, this is unbelievable, just feeling all the things he built. I'm like, this is crazy. And you go, why did he do all that? Was that just to show off to me? No. Like, look, I made an end table. No. (laughs) Why did he build all that? So that at the appointed day, he could pick that girl up and carry her through the threshold and say, welcome home. Welcome to the place that I built for you with my strength, with my mind, out of my love, so that we could enjoy each other and build a life together. And you see, that's what God does. That's what love does. God creates structure where we can flourish. And he puts a man in it and says, I've given you this place and I even named it delight, where you can enjoy me and I can enjoy you. In Genesis 2, as it talks about us and we become the thematic central of the story, it says God breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. One commentator said it has the intimacy of a kiss that God draws near humanity like no other animal. He created flocks and gaggles and pods of animals. He created one man because I want to have an intimate relationship with you one-on-one. And then when he created that man, what did he tell him to do? He said, enjoy what I've made, enjoy me. And then he said, of this ground, cultivate it and keep it. That's what's amazing about the call to humanity. He says, cultivate and keep. What does that mean? To cultivate. All you ag majors, what does it mean? I'm manipulating things. To do what? To create structure where raw material can succeed. I'm going to till up soil where it can grow. I'm going to put sticks on little trees so it'll grow straight, not to hurt the tree like, ha-ha, you're tied to a stick. I'm doing it (laughs) so the tree can become more fully what it is. And God says, that's what I've done. Out of my love for you, I created a structure where you can succeed, formed where you can flourish. And then he creates man and says, now you do that. You enter into the world the same way. And as you enter into the world, I've given you gifts and abilities and talents and passions. Use that to make the world better. Use your ability to harness skills of engineering, to build buildings we can work in and thrive in. Not just so you can make money, not just so you can make a living, not just so you can express yourself, but so that I can live and succeed in that place. Teach well, not just because I get summers off, I don't know. Teach well so that I succeed, our kids succeed. God created a world where we enjoy him and we flourish. And he says, I want you to do the same. And as the woman was brought into the picture, she joined into that, that together the man and woman would use the gifts God gave them so that everybody wins. That's what love is. And you say, what does this have to do with dating? That's how you enter the world that before I want to pair off with an individual person, let me fulfill what God meant for me to do among people, that I enjoy his love for me as he creates structure of a relationship with him where I can flourish, and then out of that source of life, let me be a source of life to my roommates and friends so they can win. Out of that source of love, let me be a source of love. When you have a source of life, you can be a source of life. When you have a source of love, you can be a source of love. If you lack a source, you won't be a giver of life. You'll be a sucker of life, right? That's why this is important. I had a friend a couple years ago, several years ago, she went scuba diving in the Caribbean and did one of those crash course things that is crazily unsafe, but she did it. And she went out there and did this scuba deal and they pair you up. So they paired her up with like this middle-aged guy, right? And they went down there, and they both had their scuba tanks on. They had their oxygen on the back, right? Their source of life as they're down there under the water. And as long as they both had their scuba tanks on, they were a real source of life to each other. They were just swimming along and just helping each other, like, cornfish. And they're just enjoying it, right? And then something went wrong with his breather. 
and he was having some trouble with it. And apparently they had given them an emergency drill they were supposed to do for the safety of all people involved. All that went out the window for him, right? He just realized, I can't breathe. And so he did the most natural thing he could think to do. Grabbed her. And all of a sudden, he was like pulling her towards him. And she's like, what are you doing? This is not the drill. And all of a sudden, he's just yanking on her. And she's like, it didn't even make any sense. And then he grabbed my little aspirator and he pulled it out. And began to suck on it. And he go, part of that makes sense. Like, let's share air together. Like, if we're both kind of need to share, let's share, right? Like, that's a source of life. Like, you breathe a little, I breathe a little. You breathe a little. But that's not what happened. Desperation set in. Where there's scarcity, there's desperation. And where there's desperation, there's exploitation. And I'm grabbing that sucker. I'm putting it in my mouth. And she said, he just kept it. And so she's clawing at him. And he's like, mm, mm. and he said, she said, he started to push down on my head. And I'm like, he's drowning me. That doesn't even make sense logically. So she just had to just start going to work on him, all right? And she's like, we're underwater. Minutes ago, we were friends. When I have a source of life, I'm a source of life. If I'm disconnected from that source of life, I suck life from you, right? And you see, the way God rigged humanity is that we have a source of life in God, so we're a source of life to each other. But when humanity decided to be selfish in Genesis 3, I'm going for mine. I'm doing me. And Eve said, I know God wants to build his kingdom. I'm going to build my kingdom. Thank you very much. And when Adam jumped in on that mentality, I don't want to be a part of God's kingdom with you. I want to be a part of my kingdom for my purposes. Once you start building your little kingdom, everybody becomes a threat. And it's interesting, as you look in the Bible, the next two men who are named in the Bible, one kills the other because you're a threat to my honor, so you gotta go. There was enough room. There was only a handful of dudes. But if I'm building my little kingdom and you're in the way, scarcity breeds desperation, and that desperation's exploitation. I'll make your blood soak into the ground. The next two women who are named by name are both appropriated by one man because God said the two will become one flesh, but he looks and says, nah, I think as a man, I'll get a couple women. And those girls are named Ada and Zilla. Their names mean warbling and tinkling. You think those are some hot ladies? <laughs> those are accoutrement kind of names. He says, I don't care about your emotions. I'm here to use you. And you see, when selfishness sets in, we stop loving each other and we start using each other. And you see violence and you see the misuse of women sexually. And that's our world today. When we break faith from God, we break faith with each other. Everything breaks. And you see in the world today where I am not connected with God, a source of life, scarcity sets in. And what happens? Every other person of the same gender is competition. Every person uh, of the opposite sex is potential someone to fill a vacancy in me or someone that's in my way. And you see in our world today, financially, people taking advantage of each other, sexually taking advantage of each other. You see Wall Street, I'm going to take money from you, and I don't care if you suffer or not. I just get to build a bigger kingdom for me. You see sexually with the advent of pornography, I know it hurts women. You look and say 90 plus percent of the women in the industry were abused as children. I don't care. I just want to use their body for my satisfaction. I don't want to have to care about their soul or the rest of them. And that's prolific in our world today. And you look around and you say, when we lose our source of life, we stop becoming a source of life for each other. We begin to suck life from each other. And that's a bad place. And when you try to start a relationship from there, then when I move towards somebody, you're someone to meet my needs. And that's how a lot of people enter dating relationships. You're here to meet my needs. And if you stop meeting my needs, well, I guess our lives just went different directions. And I don't want that for you but you stay connected to the source of life, you can be a source of life to somebody else, right? For me in college, I was a good Christian guy. But I know for me, when I thought about sex and I thought about dating, I thought about sex in terms of something that could satisfy me. I thought about dating in terms of someone that could solve my loneliness. I didn't even think about serving and caring for the emotions of a girl. 
And I remember the first time someone talked to me about real love, the kind of love 1 John 4 is talking about, where God says, do you want to see how love was manifest? The Son of God came for us that we might live through him. He was a source of life. How was he a source of life? He sacrificed himself to be a source of life for us. When I saw that, I began to weep. Because when I saw women, I didn't see someone to sacrifice my life so they could succeed. I saw them as someone to use. And God broke me. And some of you, I don't know how you see dating, the opposite sex, your own body, your own life, but for many of us, we're trying to suck life from other places to build our little kingdoms, and I want to tell you there's a source of life. We broke from it in sin, but the good news is 1 John tells us the Son of God came for us that we might live through him, and he's presented in the Bible as the true husband who came for us, his bride, the church that he gave himself up for us, that when he lived with us, he was gentle and tender with us in our sin. And then on that cross, he became the propitiation for our sins, 1 John 4 says. What does that mean? He says all the horrible, sad, broken things, all the guilt and the shame we carry, he let it land on him. That no one has to carry around guilt and shame and condemnation from what you've done in your past. He let all of it land on him and he buried it in the dirt. And as he did that, he told the story to his people. I'm going to be like a seed. He said, you just got a seed sitting on a piece, on a table. Nothing's going to happen. He says, but you take that seed and you bury it in the dirt. What happens? It breaks open and produces life. And he says, I'm going to take my life and let it be laid down in the grave. I will break and I will be buried so that from me will spring new life. And if you're here and don't know the story of the gospel, that's the story. That's what marriage is a picture of. The son of God, Jesus Christ, coming to get us back. We were made to live in the love and the life of God. We lost it and God did not cast us aside. He came running for us to bring it back. The first marriage you need to get knit into is not one with someone of the opposite sex. It's with the son of God that as we, his bride, the church, link up with him, the lover of our soul. And when you get that relationship right, let me tell you something. You go, how does it relate to dating? It takes the desperation out of dating. Because now I don't have to look for you to fill the deepest vacancies in me. I have a river. I have a source. And it frees me up to be someone who cares about you. And let me tell you something. That's the kind of person you want. Ladies, you want a guy that's not looking for you to complete him. It scares me to death when I hear guys talk like that. She is my source. She's my everything. You're like, (laughs) Because what happens when she lets you down? And if a guy talks to you like that, what happens? The first time you're like, oh, that's sweet. Oh, that's so great. And after a while you're like, (laughs) because you're like, how can I live up to that? And girls, if you're looking for a guy to fill every vacant part in your soul, he can't do that. Have you ever met a guy? Just, just watch one for a while. Just sit in the MSC and pick one and watch them, and you'll be like, I don't know why I was thinking that could solve this. They can't. But ladies, you get a guy that says, you know what? I don't know if God has marriage for me or not, but I know this. I was broken and lost in my selfishness and sin, and God forgave me, and he loved me, and he cleansed me, so I'm his. Jesus came to build a structure, a kingdom, where I can succeed, have life. He brought it back, and I'm part of his team. He's my king. I'm in his structure, so I can succeed. I'm in his form, so I can flourish. My faith is in him. You have a guy like that that's going to pursue him, and let me tell you something. That guy will love you at your best and at your worst because it honors his king to do so. And guys, you want a girl like that, that she's chasing your king. And so when she comes alongside you, she is going to honor you in sickness and in health when you meet her needs and when you fall desperately short. That's the kind of person you want. Not the person that's pursuing you, but the person that's pursuing him. And that's the best way it could happen. That I journey with the true king. Ladies, you say, I'm going to set my eyes on him. Trusting my king to satisfy my heart's needs and trusting that in his due time, if it be his will, he will link me up with one of his princes. Or men, you say, man, I'm throwing in with my king who fought death and hell to win me back. And I'm running with that man. 
And as I follow him, I will be like him and he will carve into me character. And when he sees fit, he will bring me one of his daughters that Lord willing, I'll be worthy of. That's the kind of guy you want to marry. That's the kind of guy you want to be that I'm throwing in with him. You want to be Prince Caspian from Voyage of the Dawn Treader. (laughs) I don't know if you read Chronicles of Narnia as a kid. I didn't. I read them as a college student. Uh, because I would lay in bed at night and was like, I need to think about something positive. And I thought, you know what? It's going to be story time. And I would read Chronicles of Narnia at night to myself. Like, what's going to happen next? That's all you get, Ben, right? And I would read myself (laughs) stories. And I remember reading Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Prince Caspian, that he decides, man, his allegiance is to the one true king, Aslan, right? And he gets together with a crew, and they are going to sail out onto the ocean. Where are they going to go? East, towards the sunrise. Why? Because there were men that had been lost out there, and they were going to go on a mission of rescue. And they knew we're going on a mission of rescue. And as we sail east, eventually when you hit east, you get to the kingdom of the great king. And so we will sail on our king's mission of rescue until we see him face to face as we race into the sunrise. That's what they decide to do. And you don't get good companions till you choose a journey. That's how you make friends. And as he goes on a journey, he gets companions. And as he gets companions, they shape each other and build each other up. Little reap cheap that mouse, who in the midst of difficulty and struggle, they're wondering, should we give up the journey? And one of my favorite lines in all of C.S. Lewis, this little guy says, while I can, I sail east in the dawn treader. And when she fails me, I will paddle east in my coracle. And when she sinks, I'll swim east with my four paws. And when I can swim no longer, if I've not reached Aslan's country or shot over the edge of the world in some vast cataract, I will sink with my nose to the sunrise. He says, my decision is I'm chasing our true king until the day I reach him or I die in the attempt. That's where I'm going. And all the boys were like, that's where I'm going. And as Caspian pursues the true king, what happens? On a journey is when you get companions because you have the same vision and the same values. And he meets a young girl that was a daughter of the stars, right? And this angel from above becomes his wife and they sail on towards the kingdom forever. And I read that and was like, oh, that's so nice, Lord. That's what I want. <laughs> And so I went to bed believing that. God hasn't promised me marriage, but he's promised himself, and that's enough. And I said, God, until my ship breaks apart and I drown, I am riding towards you, my true king, with my nose to the sunrise. That's the kind of man I'm going to be. And Lord, I trust that you'll bring a woman alongside that has the same vision I do, and we'll be on mission together. And he did in due time. Took me longer than all my friends. Some of you, it may take a while. But I wouldn't have traded her. I wouldn't now. It's great. And so let me tell you something. I don't know what God has in store for you in dating. We got a lot we're going to talk about this semester about it. I'm excited to get into it. But before we get a relationship with a guy or a girl right, let's get our relationship with God right. Because he's your source of life. He's your source of love. He's your stability. He's the husband who came for you, fought for you, died for you, rose for you, that you could have life. You trust him, and he will make you the kind of person you're meant to be. Well, howdy. Welcome to the back end of the podcast. I'm sitting here at the Breakaway office. This is Ben Stewart, and I'm here with Brent Minogue, our production director. Hello. And Jeff Johnson. Hello. And uh, this is the part where we kind of have a post game. Talk about how the night went for those of you who maybe weren't able to be there with us and experience it and talk a little more about content from the message we didn't get to cover um, the day before. But I'll, I'll just tell you, sitting here today, we're just blown away by how incredible it was to worship mm-hmm. in Kyle Field. That's and right. To kick off the semester there was was incredible. It was a yeah. special night, man. Yeah. It was um, it was a little chilly. <laughs> it was just a tad, but uh, it was unbelievable. So Jeff, 
tell us what it was like, man, being on that stage and looking out at that sea of students. Yeah, I think um, it's always crazy to be standing in a stadium like that, and then it's transformed into a worship service. Um, but to see the name of Jesus all over, you know, the 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 screens, uh, seeing as far as you can see a sea of students uh, singing and responding to who God is, knowing that all over the, the city they're hearing what these thousands of students are singing and saying, all over the campus they're hearing it. Uh, it's pretty incredible to be outside in general with that many students, but then you're standing in Kyle Field and it's like pretty epic uh, to be standing in a moment where you're like, yeah, this is something that we're all going to remember for a long time. Yeah. And just the impact it has, like I said, on the city and the, and the campus, because so many, you can't not be anywhere close to that stadium and not be hearing what's happening. Yeah. I mean, for miles. Yeah. So, um, and yeah. you can see that screen, I mean, from, yeah. from Brian, the neighboring mm-hmm. town. You yeah. can, and we had the name Jesus just yeah. all over the state. I mean, if you if you don't follow us on Instagram, Twitter, all that, you, you got to check out the images. I mean, they were just, it was so cool. And, yeah. and I thought spirits were high, man. Like I said, it was cold out there. Students were bundled up. They had their blankets wrapped around <laughs> them, but they were still worshiping. But, uh, <laughs> man, I just all up into it was was for me thinking about one of our board members whose life was changed coming to breakaway about relationships and realizing I don't have a relation with God figured out. And what am I doing with this girl? And, and then all the other times kind of in the old cow field, I mean, this felt really new. It's so yeah. different experience, but talking to students from that era of how God got a hold of them there. And we just walked in believing and still are walking into the semester believing God's going to do some powerful things in students' lives. And so it was great. I think the feedback we got was amazing of it's a good launch to the semester. We're talking about a real felt need in students' lives um, and and then connecting it to their bigger needs of having mm-hmm. um, having an anchor and having a sense of direction in life. And uh, I just can't wait for, for what God's going to unfold this semester, man. So yeah. I thought it was really strong. It really was. Something else that I just popped in my mind was just also, for those who are listening and don't know, I mean, with Breakaway running on 200 volunteers, I mean, we've had, we had prayer times up at Kyle Field, and that place was prepared, uh, and just students getting to be up there and praying and believing, like what you said a minute ago, believing that God would do big things for that night. I really do feel like that happened, but even going into the semester of all that he's going to do this semester, like our volunteers believing that for for their fellow students, mm-hmm. praying that, us really believing for big things, and, and then getting to see that moment take place of like, yeah, God is in control of this. Yeah. Even the weather. I mean, even passing over the rain when it was supposed to rain on us, it's sprinkled all during sound check, but yeah. you know, at the end of the day, we got to have breakaway with no rain, and um, the Lord's hand was was on it, so... Well, I agree. And I thought it was so special to have um, Mikado Henson, mm-hmm. the uh, player development coach for the Aggie football that's team, awesome. come out and you go, you know, that's their house. Mm-hmm. And for him to stand on that stage and just pray a blessing over our students so was great. just so cool yeah. and so powerful. And I mean, yeah. that could have been it and it would have been amazing. And yeah. and what was cool, Brent, I mean, uh, you were telling us today, and I'd love for you to tell everybody, like, you know, it wasn't just the students freezing in that stadium no. with us or tracking along. I mean, you were watching the numbers in the booth, man. Yeah. Well, if you don't know, um, we do a live stream of Breakaway. We started that last semester. And so if you're ever sitting around on a Tuesday night, uh, go to our website and uh, click on the live stream around nine o'clock. And you'd love to love to show you what, what's happening in the arena. But mm. we get to talk with students. It's a cool, or students, people. We get to uh, talk with them from all over the world. We get to ask them where they're from and how they found out about us. And on the live stream last night, they were just kind of spouting off, hey, I'm in Australia. Hey, I'm in Malaysia. I'm in Korea. Um, we had people streaming um, on campus who who uh, needed to study their syllabi or something or didn't, <laughs> didn't want to come out and brave the storm. But it's a cool resource that was available to people to do. And I, I have a one quick story that pops into my head. Uh, just talking to one of our street team leaders is uh, they had uh, they our street team is the team that's out there doing a lot of the just inviting students on campus to breakaway. It's mm-hmm. it's the they are the front lines. They're the people that are out there holding signs, uh, letting people know where we're at, what we're doing, and then telling them, hey, this is something special that we want you to be a part of. No matter what your background is with church, no matter what your understanding of God is, we want you to come and 
and -hmm. hear this message. And uh, I was just talking to our team leader, and he said, last night, one of our girls uh, holding a sign outside Kyle Field uh, shared the gospel four times with four different people, and uh, mm-hmm. three of them were not planning to come into Kyle Field, and three of them walked into Kyle Field last night. <laughs> and That's just awesome. amazing, just amazing. Uh, yeah. They were just thinking they were going home, and God said, nope, I'm actually going to intersect you with this volunteer, and this volunteer is going to encourage you to go be a part of something special. And Kyle Field was a blast. We were out there setting up, worked with some great people, and yeah. uh, and I think I, I pray, and I think God was honored. We keep hearing fun stories already, and uh, they're just, I think, small glimpses of, of yeah. what really was going on in people's hearts. It's yeah. amazing. Well, and we talked about it. You know, the strength of an organization is built on the strength of its people, mm-hmm. and Breakaway has always grown because there were students who said, this has impacted my life. I'm going to go invite my friends or my roommates, my sweet mates. And, and that's true of Breakaway, but it's true of the church. I mean, God sovereignly is gathering his people, but he does it through us. And you go, you know what? Um, the church grows because people go, this message changed my life, and I want these people to know that. Mm-hmm. And that's how Breakaway grows. I mean, God uses you, Jeff, and me, and he uses, Brent, all that you set up, but it's, it's going to grow because there's students whose lives have been changed, right. and they look at another student and say, I want you to know what, I've, what I have, and I want you to, to experience what I've found. And to know the Lord that I know. And I love that. And so wherever you are listening to this, that's true in every context that um, when we come to know Christ, we are given that ministry of reconciliation. We're ambassadors on his behalf, pleading for people to be reconciled to God. And so I hope we all carry that into our respective spheres because that's how the church will grow. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I won't re-preach the talk uh, in this moment. We got a lot of a lot more talks on this sort of stuff before we're all done. And some of you may be going, well, I'm married. What are we doing? Well, just to give you a sense of it, we're going to start talking about singleness. We're going to move into dating and into engagement and then into marriage. And so we're going to talk about a lot of issues that come into relationships. So some of it may not be the stage of life you're in, but there'll be concepts that are transferable to every stage. But, uh, you know, for me, walking into this talk, um, a lot of what I was carrying in my heart was... I just did a lot of secular reading about the world. I thought good preaching connects the eternal truth of God with the very temporary circumstances of the immediate day. And I just wanted to get my head around the day. And it's interesting to see, and I just wanted to quote this in here because I thought it was so amazing. Slate is a website that is by no stretch of the imagination, a Christian website. You're not going to find that perspective on Slate at all. You've, I usually go there to find the opposite. I'm not necessarily commending their website to you. I'm just saying periodically I'll go to it for a research on a different point of view. And so it was fascinating as they were talking about the rates of um, unmarried pregnancies and kids born with, and, and them seeing the problems from that. Here's someone that's coming with no allegiance to the Bible at all. And yet, as this article was written in Slate um, two years ago, the the conclusion of the article about our world today, and particularly people in their 20s today, they concluded by saying, young adults owe it to their children to try to bring them into a home with two loving parents who are ready to support them and one another. And then it ended with contemporary young adults need to be intentional about sequencing the baby carriage after the marriage, just as the country needs to be more intentional about stabilizing the fragile foundations of family life in poor and middle American communities across the United States. So it's fascinating. These people without any allegiance to the Bible, no biblical convictions, are just looking at the world today and going, all this stuff about sleep with whoever you want and marriage is a dead institution. You just do whatever. They're seeing the repercussions of that. And they're going, this isn't good. This isn't good for our young people. This isn't good for their children. This isn't good. And they're calling people back to, without even realizing it, biblical principles. They've just came to that conclusion from the other direction. But it's interesting. You can either read the Bible and go, this is the best way to live. I'm going to do it. Or you can read the culture and go, all these other ways don't work. The best way to do it is a committed, covenantal, loving relationship that's stable. It's not just good for the parent, it's good for the kid, and it's not just good for the kid, it's good for a society. Uh, And uh, I was talking with a friend before um, Breakaway that does 
did prison ministry. And he said, you know, Ben, the first time I ever did it, I just decided to ask all of them, tell me about your dads. And he said, not a single one of them had a dad who was alive, involved in their house or in the home. And that that's not to say you're doomed if your dad wasn't at home. Mine wasn't. A lot of people's weren't. And God does amazing things no matter how broken you are, no matter what kind of mess you grew up in or mess you've made in life. Our story is one of forgiveness and redemption. But the truth is, we can look at the world today, and it's interesting that even from a secular perspective, you can open your eyes and go, this isn't good, and we need something more. And what's fascinating is, without realizing it, very secular institutions are saying, we need a biblical model of marriage and a biblical model of treating one another with kindness and persevering to love one another sacrificially. And so I just wanted to throw that out there because that's fascinating to me and it's burdening to me. I, I don't blame our 20 somethings for the culture today. They were raised up in it, but I am just more fired up than ever to look out into the next generation and to call them not, not backwards to some bygone era, but to call them forward into chasing the Lord who made them because that's where they're going to be a stable person, a secure person, and uh, a source of life for the world. So I'm pumped up about this semester, yeah, man, yeah. and I'm getting ready to get going. So I'll stop preaching now because I'm going on and on, but that's how I feel <laughs> about it. So uh, thank you guys for sitting in here too. And uh, yeah. I think it's going to be pretty amazing. So next week, Brent? Hey, we've got a lot coming. Yeah, next week we'll be in Reed Arena. We'd love for all of you to join us. And if you can't, join the live stream and uh, we'll be back with the podcast. We hope you enjoyed this uh, message and we're excited, like Ben said, for the semester. There's a lot of fun stuff coming and can't wait to share it all with you as we move ahead. So thanks for listening. Thanks.